Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show where we talk about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. My name is Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I welcome you to join me as I talk to everyday people with not so everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation on the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page or access additional VIP content as a premium subscriber via Patreon. For just a couple of dollars a month, you can get an early access to episodes, additional bonus content, and your chance to connect with my guests. To do so, simply visit patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. Let's talk near death. I had two near death experiences, one in 1992 and one in 1994. I sit down and this large blood clot, the size of a baby's head, comes out. You know, I still saw the ceiling, but I was outside my body. When I arrive, I hear the most beautiful music, but the music is more beautiful than any music you can make on the earth plane. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Lottie Valentine, who is a speaker, a physician, an evidential medium, and an author. She's experienced two near-death experiences, which led on to her starting medical school at age 54. Today, she's teaching workshops in psychic and mediumship development, as well as offering private readings and shamanic ceremonies. She is the author of the book, Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul, and lives in Phoenix, Arizona, where she operates the Center for Integrative Medicine, as well as her spiritual center, Divine Spiritual Essence. Dr. Lottie Valentine, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure. I'm so keen to hear about these two near-death experiences. So can you tell us a little bit about how all of this happened? Yes, I had two near-death experiences, one in 1992 and one in 1994. And the two near-death experiences are actually very different. Um, So I will talk about both of them and what happened. But the first mm-hmm. near-death experience happened after my third child was born. And it started out with that I gave birth during an earthquake, a 7.4 earthquake. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dramatic birth. She was born between the 7.4 and the 7.2 earthquake. And because I literally thought that I was going to die, um, they were leaning over me, trying to hold me onto the table so I wouldn't just levitate off all the instruments in the room were levitating off the tables and there was this entire wall of windows and this hospital was built on rollers. It was, I gave birth in California, which is known as, you know, earthquake uh, country, Mm. so to speak. Mm. And it was one of those moments when, you know, life flashes before your eyes and you think you are going to die. And it was so dramatic that my labor actually stopped. We lost all the power in the hospital and My labor then picked up about an hour later, and she was born. And after I gave birth, this was the first time I hemorrhaged, and they gave me the baby to hold finally after going through these two earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And I just leaned backwards and started screaming, take the baby, take the baby, because I was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. And then they would massage my abdomen and my uterus, and this large mountain, like the size of a soccer ball, of blood clots came out and then um, because now we're under you know we're still having a tremendous amount of aftershocks we don't have electricity in the hospital we're running on generators and they put me on IV drip uh, pitocin to contract the uterus to stop that bleeding Mm -hmm. and after about 48 hours they sent me home and it seemed like the bleeding had stopped and everything was okay But then um, 10 days later, I I kept having this pain as if somebody was pushing down on my uterus from the inside. Like imagine a big fist in your abdomen pushing down on your vaginal area. It was this great pressure. Mm. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I went to the grocery store. My parents were visiting to help with my boys. My boys were six and three and a half at the time and the newborn baby. And I would have to sit down on the shelves in the grocery store because the pain was so great. And it would come on from, from standing up or, 
or holding on to anything. I couldn't even hold the baby. At times I would have to ask mm-hmm. somebody to hold it. And I thought that maybe, you know, this was my third birth that I had given birth and we're all natural births. And I thought maybe because the baby was really big, she was 9.2 pounds, which wow. is a big baby. And she was born on her due date. And I th- I thought maybe because the, you know, the tissue down in the vaginal area was healing I mean, I couldn't understand what was going on. And then my friends were holding a baby shower for me in the park because I finally had a girl and they were going to give me all these, all these pink girl things because mm-hmm. I had two boys before. And I arrive at the park and I know I have to use the restroom. And I said, this feels really strange. And I go to the restroom and I sit down and this large blood clot, the size of a baby's head comes out and it drops into the toilet. And it's one of those moments when you stare into the toilet and you don't, you feel nauseated with fear because you know, something Mm -hmm. is really, really wrong. So I told my friend uh, what had happened and I put everybody back in the car, drove the few blocks back home. And my husband came home from work and took me to the emergency room And as we arrive in the emergency room, they examine me and they say, well, not much, not much bleeding is going on right now. And Mm -hmm. they kept me for observation. And after two or three hours, they said, well, sometimes it can be a second lining that comes out after you give birth. And they sent me home. Well, the next evening, the same scenario happened. I had a huge blood clot the size of a baby's head. We called the hospital, asked what to do. And they said, okay, see the doctor where you live tomorrow morning, which was in Huntington Beach, California. I see the doctor. Now it's Friday morning. This started on Wednesday and I've hemorrhaged twice already. I see the doctor. He does the same thing. He does a manual exam. He says, not much bleeding is going on right now. No lab work, no ultrasounds, nothing. Sends me home. This is in 1992. Mm -hmm. So I go back home and then that evening, the same thing happens again. I go to use the restroom and another large blood clot, the size of a baby's head drops into the toilet. Mm-hmm. You know, I call for my parents. I call for my husband. We decide, okay, this time let's just go back to the emergency room. We don't know what else to do. And I go back. We tell them what happened. They keep me for our observation. So there I am lying in the emergency room. The door is closed. I don't have a bell to ring or uh, any buttons to buzz. This is 1992. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it was very different, I guess, back then. You know, we weren't as technical as we are now. Mm. And they come in, they examine me. Not much is going on right now. And I just lie there. And after a while, I finally started bleeding again. So I'm thinking, great, I'm finally bleeding. They're (laughs) going to figure out something is finally wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm lying there literally in a pool of blood and randomly this nurse comes in and opens the door to check on me and as she opens the door her jaw just drops and she's just oh my gosh you know and I can hear the call on the loudspeaker you know OBGYN stack to the ER OBGYN stack to the ER and I'm lying there thinking oh this is great they finally figured out something is wrong with me so I'm kind of you know feeling relieved and this about 50-year-old man comes jogging in out of breath into the ER. And I'm thinking, oh, finally, they sent a doctor that looks like he's been through a couple of things in his life. He'll know what to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so him and his probably a resident physician, a younger physician, examined me again. And as they examined me, another large blood clots. And that was the fifth time I'm hemorrhaging in three days. The size of a baby's head comes out. And as this large blood clot comes out, this is when I knew something was going wrong. And so I try to sit up to tell the doctor what's going on. And I said, I don't feel too good. And he knew right away because he knew how much I had been bleeding. And so he just pushed me down onto the table and the room filled with emergency medical staff. And as I'm lying on that table, they're tipping it backwards. So my head is going down towards the floor and my feet are going up towards the ceiling, you know, to keep the blood, the little blood that I had left in my vital organs, my head, my heart. And as I'm lying there, there is a nurse on my left and she's trying to get an IV into my arm 
But the problem is that, you know, once you go, pers- if a patient goes into shock or the blood pressure drops too much, it's very difficult to get the, I, to get the needle in because the veins start to collapse. Mm-hmm. So there, she was struggling to get that in. And on my right, I have a nurse with a blood pressure cuff quoting my blood pressure. So as I'm lying on the, on the table, it's, it is as if I jumped out of an airplane, just free fall, you know, without a parachute falling towards the ground or <clears throat> being in an elevator. For those of you who are riding elevators all the time, as if the elevator just drops down through mm. its shaft. Mm. It's, it's just that feeling of free fall. And as I'm falling, I can feel, you know, them struggling. I can hear the nurse on my right and she yells out, 50 over 15, hurry, she says, as my blood wow. pressure is dropping. And it was very shortly after she said 50 over 15 that I knew that I was dying, which was very, very different from the experience in the earthquake when I thought I was going to die. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is, the, this is it. I never thought I was going to die this way. This was very different. This was a complete awareness of the fact that I was dying. Uh-huh. So... As I'm in this state um, of knowing that I'm dying and I just feel weaker and weaker and weaker and the only way I can describe it is so hard to describe these feelings is as if you're hanging off a big cliff on a mountain with just your nails and then at any moment you know that it's going to give way and you're going to fall to your death. It was mm-hmm. that kind of a feeling. It was You're just hanging on for your life. And I can feel my soul is starting to want to leave my body. And I'm holding on for my life, trying to keep my soul inside my body. But as I'm doing this, I was a complete atheist going into this experience. I did not believe in God or Jesus or any religion. If you could not touch it, smell it, hear it, or see it, as far as I was concerned, it did not exist. So here I am struggling for my life, holding on for my dear life, what do I do? I pray to God to save my life. There <laughs> yeah, was I love it. Nothing. <laughs> there was nothing left for me to do than to pray. And uh-huh. I said, my, I have three children under the age of six. They need a mother. Please let me live. And as I'm saying this prayer and I'm, I'm struggling to hold on to my body, my soul just pops out. And all of a sudden, I find myself floating outside my body. But I didn't, I never had one of those experiences where people say they look down and see themselves. Mm -hmm. I was not, I still saw the ceiling, but I was outside my body and my body was below me. But then there was this um, realization of uh, just unconditional love and peace in this state. But there was also a realization that I was still there. So my first thought was, how can I still be me? How can I still be here when I'm not in my body? How does this work? How can I still think? How can I be you know, aware of what's going on and be outside my body? Because I didn't have any beliefs. When you die or you leave, there is no such thing as leaving your body. There is no such thing as life after death. My belief was, if you die or, you know, that's it, it's black. There are mm-hmm. no such thing as spiritual, no spiritual experiences. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, a realization for me that how can I still be here? And there was also an awareness that there is no time on the other side because there I knew that I had access to all information that ever was like past, present and future. There is no time. So I was in this state of, no time, but I was still me, but I was outside my body. Mm -hmm. And then as I'm in this state, all of a sudden I get sucked back in. So just like a big, the only way I can describe it is like a big vacuum hose that you just like sucked back in. Mm -hmm. Um, if, I don't know if you have a Santa Claus with Tim Allen, an old movie, when he goes through the chimney to deliver presents, but <laughs> it's, my best, <laughs> it's my best description because it's literally, there was this ginormous force that just sucked me back in. But the transition from being in my body and outside my body was so fast and so instantaneous that it is as if my earthly mind can't really comprehend it. 
because yeah. I am stuck in this body to have this earthly experience. And it's very difficult to understand what goes on when you're in this other state. How can you just pop out and then pop back in? Yeah. But this leads to my second near death experience, which is very different where I go to see the light. So what happened um, with this was after I came back, I was, I got really sick and I was sick for a good year and I had something called bone marrow suppression. My, my white blood cells got suppressed. My red blood cells were suppressed. My platelets, and I was bruising. I was getting sick all the time. And literally, I existed in this state for six years. Wow. And I never thought I was going to get well. And wow. it, was, it was really a crazy time period. And then I had all this electrical interference. My watches were stopping. <laughs> Yeah. And VCRs would not turn on, television turned on when I walked by them. Wow. And it was it was really crazy. And I had that first year, my watch would only take for a week. And it took me nine months until I was strong enough to actually go to a store, spend five minutes in a store and buy a new watch. And I was really excited because it was a big accomplishment to even leave the house after yeah, exactly. nine months. Yeah. Because I was so sick. And I came home and I was really excited about this watch. And after five weeks, five days, it stopped. Aww. So <laughs> I, was, I was so disappointed. And yeah. I went back to the store and I said, it stopped. And they said, wow, that's so strange. We haven't gotten any other watches back. And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe that is a problem with the manufacturing. And they said, well, let's go pick out another one. So I go pick out the same watch. I bring it home. I wear it for five days and it stops. Oh, so I bring it back. The same lady at the store. Oh, this is so really <laughs> strange. <laughs> we haven't gotten any other watches back. I was like, well, maybe it's the quality control process. I'll take, I'll pick out a different brand this time. Uh -huh. So I had a completely different watch, different brand, go home, wear it for five days, it stopped. Uh -huh. So then I tell my friend, and she says, she looks at me and she laughs. She says, it's not the watch, honey, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I, all these other problems of the lights were flickering. Every time I would read stories to my boys lying down, my four-year-old would say, why do the lights always flicker or blink when you read stories and never when dad reads stories? And, you know, not wanting to scare them, I would just say, oh, it must be a problem with the electrical wiring or, yeah. you know, it's a little glitch somewhere. But it was very consistent. And, and now, you know, we know that people who have experienced an NDE uh, to mm. have these um, electrical interferences. Exactly. And um, when my daughter, the week my daughter or the month my daughter turned one, it was in June, May, June, the following year. So it's been a year now. I walked by the television and it turned on. And I said, okay, the kids, the boys were now seven and, and four, four and a half. So I said, well, the boys must have the clicker. So I look outside. No, they're playing with their friends, like in a little courtyard. So then I said, well, somebody else was watching television. They have the same television. They aimed the clicker at their television, but it went out <laughs> the window in my window, and oh, then it hit my television. I um, love the extent <laughs> to which you're trying to justify it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. There's the very scientific atheist having these experiences. <laughs> so it was so difficult to make sense out of it. And I went to ring eight neighbor doorbells, okay? They were, not, wow. they were either not home or they were not watching TV. They must have thought I was not, uh, not <laughs> like yeah. this woman Maybe. is crazy. Maybe. <laughs> right? And then I come back in and I walk by television. It turns back on. Oh, wow. So it was just, you know, just, it, and it's just how it was for a long time. And it took me 12 years to have my watch tick for one year. So after one year, my, tick, my watch would tick for about a month. After two years, about two months. After three years, about three months. And it went on like that. So when my daughter was three, I had like 16, 17 watches in my drawer because sometimes they would start ticking again and I could get a few more days out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would always buy them with a second hand because it was yeah. the only way I would know if they were ticking. Yeah. So I would have to wait. If somebody said, what time is it? I would look at my watch and I would be, I'd make sure the second hand was moving and then I would tell them what time it was. But it was just a lot of electrical interference. And so what happened, what led into that second NDE was that I was in this state of electrical interference, having all these after effects and being very sick with a immu suppressed immune system. 
And every day, ever since I, since that first near death experience, it was as if my soul wasn't merged back into my body. Mm -hmm. And the best way I can describe this is if you think of laying like a puzzle and you have, you're putting in that last piece of the puzzle and, but it sticks up yeah. and you try to smush it and you try to hit it so that it becomes level with the rest of the puzzle pieces, but it keeps sticking up. And that's sort of what it felt like. My soul wasn't merged back in. It wasn't one with my body. It wasn't, um, it wasn't one. It wasn't flat. It wasn't, um, like a leveled surface. So what I'm saying? Yeah. So the, the soul wasn't um, merged back in completely. Now, I don't know if that was because of a soul merging problem or if it was because I was so sick or both. But that's how I existed. And every day, like, if, you know, 10 times a day, I would have this feeling of my soul trying to leave and I was always trying to hold on to my soul. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, feeling faint. I couldn't go to the grocery store. I would have to sit down in the grocery stores, put my head down. I couldn't walk through, uh, you know, like a large department store to, you know, like those big warehouses where you mm. shop. I don't know if you have those in New Zealand, uh, yeah. but I couldn't walk through a store without having to sit down, put my head down. Cause I literally would have passed out and I would have people approach me in the store saying, are you going to, are you going to faint? You're really pale. And I would think, oh, no, I got 30 more seconds. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> because I, it was my existence at the time. And it was just uh, a very crazy. And it was a very crazy year because it's kind of a blessing and a curse because we didn't have any medical insurance. Now, this is the United States. Oh, I don't know no. what we're dealing yeah. with. Yeah. But we had medical insurance right when my daughter was born. But then my... Com my um, husband was a regional manager and his company got bought and everybody got laid off. It was a big mess. So he had to find a new job. And when you get a new job in the United States, there's a three month wait period for insurance. Mm -hmm. And so he took a new job and then, but he had been like in a regional management position, but he just took whatever job he could get because it was such a sudden and he, you know, here he was, he had to support a whole family. Yeah. So he took whatever he could get quickly and then after three months, right when we were about to get insurance in December, he got another job offer. And he said, are you sure you want me to take it? And I said, yes, well, I'm getting better. Don't worry. Just take the better job. And then again, three months later, this oh, happened again. No. So we had no insurance for that entire year. We didn't get insurance until one month uh, and one year and one month after my daughter was born. And so at this point, now I know I'm starting to get better. So now I don't, I go to the doctor and they are all panicking because they see I'm covered in bruises and there's some, you know, something is very wrong with you. And I keep ripping up. I'm not, was not a very good compliant patient. And I write about this in my book. Don't do what I did. <laughs> it was really stupid now in hindsight, but I came, I came from a family of, of doctors. My father was a family practitioner. My mom was a hospital administrator uh, in the hospital and one of my brothers is a surgeon. So I had always been around all the stories of what goes wrong. And so I, now that I knew that I was getting better, I would tell the doctor, look, I got myself here. I drove, I got in my car, I brought my children and I showed up in this office. I couldn't have done that six months ago. Yeah. And so, you know, th th this went on for, for a good five or six years until I finally recovered. I think it was 10 years until I had my blood work done because oh, wow. I, kept, I kept avoiding because I knew, I, I knew enough about medicine having grown up in that environment mm -hmm. that something was really wrong. I knew something was wrong with my blood. And now that I've gone to medical school, I, you know, now I understand that what it was that I had. And, you know, I, sh I shuddered at the thought sitting in, in medical school, learning about it and thinking how stupid I had been, yeah. <laughs> you know, in hindsight. But then the treatments that I would have received for the condition, you know, this suppression of the bone marrow would probably have caused a lot of damage to other parts of my body. So now it's a blessing. Yeah, blessing in disguise. All right. That yeah. I didn't have, that it didn't go that way. So uh, you know, it's good and bad. But if people wonder why this whole crazy story, why I was sick for so long, but that's because I didn't have medical insurance. And then I would just go to walk-in clinics. Um, and I got really sick that after six months, um, we all got the flu. And I went, we went to a walk-in clinic and 
we had the pneumonia and bad ear infections. And then after eight days of antibiotics, I got, I was even sicker. So I went, everybody else in the family was on the mend. Mm-hmm. And I went back and they pulled, they drew my blood and they came back in the room and they said, do you have AIDS or leukemia? And I said, oh. well, I hope neither. And they yeah. said, did you get a blood transfusion? And I said, no, I refused a blood transfusion after I bled out. Um, because there was so much AIDS, the AIDS epidemic, and we had no cure. We had no way of testing the blood back then. Right. And so they kept me in the hospital uh, extra long to like two or three days because they wanted to make sure I could make blood quickly. But mm-hmm. after that first near-death experience, I, I don't have many, many memories for the three mo- first three months because I slept most of the time mm-hmm. and my body was very cold because I had so little blood because, mm-hmm. because I didn't get a blood transfusion. And who knows, maybe that's what caused this suppression in the end. Who knows? It was, it was all meant to be this way. It's, yeah, that's how I look at it now. Oh, <laughs> well, that's good. But, um, yeah. But that, so that was my, you know, my other indication when they came in and asked me if I had AIDS or leukemia. And they said, you have no white blood cells. That's why you're so sick. So I already knew then that my, my immune system was suppressed. And then I started bruising after that. So something, you know, went wrong in that, in that uh, path. But then what happened, so I'm in this state, and now um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living in this, holding on to my soul every day, mm-hmm. feeling weak, um, getting sick, getting pneumonia you know, all the time, and just barely functioning. I can't go to the grocery store without almost passing out. So this is the state I'm, I'm living in. And so then, so this is now two years later, and every night when I go to, sometimes where I would wake up at night, and if I had my head on the pillow, that would be cause me to be faint because I would have too little blood in my head. So I would put take my head off the pillow and be flat and then just hold on to my soul and, you know, pull my legs up sometimes and just, you know, say, get more blood to the head. Mm-hmm. And that was just my existence. And so my second near death experience happened in the middle of the night, uh, two years, a little bit more than two years and three months later after my first near death experience. And this is very, a very different experience than the first one. And I always laugh at it now because I feel like, okay, they didn't get to tell me the whole story the first time I died or had my near death experience. So they had to, (laughs) they had to do it again to get the message across because this second near death experience is literally what activated my life path. So you know, the first one had thrown me for a loop in the sense that I was an atheist. I didn't believe in anything. And I was, you know, I've been contemplating, how does this work? How can you still be there? This is not supposed to be this way. And is there something greater, you know, and more divine out there that I'm not understanding yet? So here I am lying in bed and I wake up and I have this faint feeling in the middle of the night, take my head off the pillow. I lie there, I hold on to my soul, but it is just, like in a split second, because that transition of being in your body and being outside your body is just that it's an instantaneous. It's just one second you're inside and the next second you're outside. Mm -hmm. And so I just get sucked out of my body faster than I can even comprehend. And I travel not through a tunnel. Like a lot of people say, it was just darkness, just black It's more a feeling of tumbling through space. That was the feeling. Right. And then I got to this place that I call the mid station because there was an awareness that it it was as if there were levels below me and levels above me, like you could go higher or you could have gone lower. So I call it the mid station. Like when you go skiing, you can take the lift all the way to the top of the mountain or you can go Mm -hmm. to the mid station. So I, I arrived at this mid station and when I arrive, I hear the most beautiful music. But the music is more beautiful than any music you can make on the earth plane. And I grew up playing the piano and I played the guitar and, you know, I was singing and things like that yeah. from a musical family. But there, there, there is no music that sounds like that on the earth plane. Mm-hmm. And so I arrive at this mid station and I hear this most beautiful music and I'm wondering where it's coming from. And... I see a log cabin and I think this is funny, the things that we see and it's, you know, everybody sees different things and I'm seeing these little log cabins and I always wonder if it's because 
it was somehow comforting to me because I grew up in Sweden and log cabins. It yeah, was maybe. Familiar. And this is interesting to me, the different things that we experience. But I hear this most beautiful music. I don't have a body. I'm in a soul state. So I'm without my body, but I'm, I'm me. Mm-hmm. And I open the door to this log cabin that is literally just floating in space. And I open the door and I look inside, but it's empty. So then I said, well, that's so strange. Where's the music coming from? So I look to my left and there is an exact replica of the log cabin, but on my left. So it's like a mirror image of the other log cabin. So I open that door and I look inside, but it's empty. Uh So then I was, I'm still wondering, I'm, I'm seeing these two log cabins. Where's the music coming from? But then now I become aware of this light behind me and it's the, the most whitest, brightest light that you could ever imagine. You know how they take pictures of the sun and you can see them on the internet and they're very mm. white and it's this white light. It's like that, but times 10. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like that, but it's, it's so white and it's so bright. And I understand, I can see that light is coming from behind me. So I turn around, but so now I am in the light. But as I'm in the light, there is this, feeling of unconditional love and it's just love and peace and it's just uh, this feeling that you just wouldn't ever want to leave is you want to be in that light forever and mm. it is just so magnificent that there there is the words trying to use to describe it are just not sufficient yeah, there, there aren't, aren't words <laughs> there aren't <laughs> there aren't any words for this and this light is so magnificent and so peaceful and so loving. But when I'm in this light, it is this knowing, it's, it's the knowing that I'm with God's source and I don't believe in God. So, right? So, <laughs> yep. but I, I understand that I am with God's source or divine source or whatever you want to call it. I am with divine source, but I'm, I am the light. I am the light. I carry the light within me. I'm part of the light. And it's this connection with that divine source that I am that. I come from that. But then the music is coming from the light. But as I look at the light, I see an outline of angels. I don't see the angels themselves, but I see an outline of angels. And the music is coming from the angels, but the other funny part is that I don't believe in angels, but it's still what I'm seeing. Wow. So it's just so interesting to me because people, you know, would, if I had heard this story from somebody else, I would have said, well, (laughs) obviously they were religious or obviously they believed in angels. And so this is what I had to experience. I didn't believe in any of it. And this is what I saw. Uh-huh. And so then I become aware of two spirit guides. There's one on my right and one like diagonally to my left in front of me. I don't see them, but I'm aware of their presence. And there is this telepathic communication. And the one on my right speaks to the other spirit guide. And he says, what is she doing here? She can't be here. She has to go back. And I say, no, no, no. Wait a second. How does this work? Like, I'm not yeah. going back. This is the second time. Uh-huh. <laughs> I want to know how this works. Uh-huh. So the other guy, to the, diagonally to the left in front of me, says, well, if I told you, you wouldn't remember, but you will remember this. And it is as if they can control like, what we can remember. And now, you know, afterwards, I've heard a lot of stories about this. And I understand that there is some control mechanism that they can sort of control what we remember. Yeah. But it didn't make any sense, you know, at the time. And so he said, well, you will remember this. And then it's like almost like a movie screen. Something it just appears, like images just appear. And now it is as if I'm standing on the moon and I'm looking down on the earth. But around the earth, there is this a grid or a silvery, glittery, what I call the fishnet. Because I had grown up in, the, in Scandinavia, in Sweden, and we would lay fishnets in the ocean mm-hmm. And when my grandmother lifted those nets out of the ocean early in the morning and there were water droplets on them, Mm. then the sun would shine on it and it would sort of sparkle and glitter. So to me, it looked like a fishnet around the earth. And he said, everything on earth is connected up to this grid, but everything on earth is connected to each other. And with that, I got sent back into my body, slam dunk, I'm back 
as fast as I left. And it's just this slam dunk back. I can't even explain it because it happens so fast. Mm -hmm. And I still have a hard time comprehending how you can just get out of your body and sort of be in this different state. And it, what seems to be in a different place, but it's actually just a different state of existence, right? Yeah. And just come back into my body. But it is what <clears throat> that experience, and together with the first one, is what really activated my life path. So after these experiences, I started becoming more, you know, clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient, meaning mm -hmm. that I would start seeing things before they happened or hearing things. Um, and that went on, you know, just grew for each year mm -hmm. as, you know, as time went on. And it was, um, let's say, 2000, um, around 2004, yes, 12 years out. So my um, daughter was born 1992. So in 2004, 12 years, I declared myself healed. My watch had ticked for an entire year. Wow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it stopped. And then I took my watch off. That's it. I didn't wear one until I went to med school. I was like, that's it. I'm healed. I ticked yep. for a whole year. And then um, it was the, I started to hear, I had had a lot of experiences with seeing things or hearing things, um, being told who, you know, my father was going to die and mm. we were going to be in an accident. And I would tell my family members about all these different events. And I didn't really understand how, you know, all this worked and how can you see things before they happen? Does that mean everything yeah. is predetermined? Yeah. Right. Cause I would be told that my father was dying. My father had a stroke and we were all, they were, parents were in Sweden and my children and, myself are going to fly over and I talked to my brother who is a surgeon and I said should I be get, get on an airplane right now and he said no you don't have to just just wait come next week you know he's doing great he's been moved into a rehab unit he's out of ICU he's laughing at our jokes and he just he's lost his speech but it, it'll probably come back don't worry he'll be fine and then that we were leaving on uh, Monday and that Friday, we took the kids to the bookstore to get books on tape and things like that um, so they could listen to it on the flight. And I started seeing uh, my dad's coffin, complete with flower arrangements, oh. complete uh, from an angle slightly above from the right. And that's how I saw it. And I kept telling my husband, my father's going to die. I don't know what's wrong because all I knew was that he was doing great and he was in rehab. Yeah. And. Afterwards, I found out that the time I started seeing his coffin was when he had collapsed on Friday evening right. and had taken a turn for the worse. And um, he had started bleeding out uh, from the medication they had given him to thin the blood clot. And so he started hemorrhaging internally. And when we arrived on, on that Tuesday morning, um, he passed away an hour after I arrived. He was just uh, holding on to me get there. Yeah. But, during the funeral, um, my mom picked that flower arrangement that I had seen on his coffin. When we went to his funeral service, it was a round um, room that had tiered seating up. And I was, and I, when I saw that, I understood why I had seen the coffin from slightly, slightly above, uh, above, and mm -hmm. from on a right angle. And when I walked in, instead of going to that seat myself, I asked, where am I supposed to sit? I am the daughter. And they pointed me to the seat. And that was the exact wow. place from you know, right angle from above. So all these things happen, you know, a lot <laughs> during these yeah. years. And in 2004, I had gotten so used to um, seeing things or hearing things or getting messages or warnings all the time that it became the spirits talking to me, I'm listening. And it uh -huh. just became um, part of my life at that point. And I was in my living room in 2004, and I had just declared myself healed. My watch had ticked for a year. I called my best friend. I said, that's it. I did it. I'm healed. You know, everything's great. And as I'm walking from the living room to the kitchen, I bec I'm become aware of a spirit guide. And the spirit guide says, um, you have to go to medical school. You have to be a naturopathic doctor. You are uh, to you know uh, combine the east and the west. 
as I understood it, like kind of like the old and the new. Mm-hmm. And that's in a sense, naturopathic medicine is that because we study acupuncture and botanical medicine mm-hmm. and we study pharmaceutical medicine. So we sort of combine it um, depending on which protocols are best for the patient. And it was, um, so they said, you have to be a doctor, you have to combine East and West and you have to bring messages and healing to the people and you have to write two books. No, wait, three. <laughs> and so, and I said, what do you, you know, I'm talking to the spirit and I'm like, what, wait, what do you mean write books? Write about what? What am I supposed to write about? And the spirit world was this, don't worry about it. We'll tell you when the time is right. And I literally enrolled in pre-med classes within two weeks. And wow. I started take going, uh, taking you know, the chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, and biology, and all those classes. And then uh, it was in 2012, uh, I, completed, I completed all my prereqs, and I went back to work for a little bit for four years because my kids were teenagers and I couldn't really move them. And I had, mm-hmm. to, I had to move from California to Arizona to go to school because the school where I wanted to go uh, was in Arizona. And sure, I know, so I applied in, and sure enough, I got accepted. So that is how I ended up going to medical school when I was 54 years old. And wow. started in, in 2012, and then oh graduated in 2016, did my residency, and then uh, last year opened up, opened up my own private practice here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh-huh. So and it's going well? Yep, yeah. So now, I, you know, I do... So then I wrote my book last year, or I started that a year after I got out of med school, 2017, and I published it um, in November. And the book is the book is called Med School After Menopause, The Journey on My Soul. I love uh, that name. I think it's so clever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's meant to inspire other people because we have a tendency to think that, first of all, we think that we go into menopause and life is over, Right or that you can't change career because you've turned 40 or 45. Mm-hmm. And the truth is that you've only lived maybe half of your adult life. And if we're all going to be 100 years old, you've got a long way to go. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to look at it that way because there is a lot of 70 and 80-year-olds 80 that are still working and are in very good health conditions. And I don't want to play golf for 30 years. So <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's so many good things that we can do to help other people. So I wrote, so the the title of the book is to inspire other people to do, you know, something with their life and it's okay to change your path. You're not too old. You're never too old to, to transform your life. Yeah. But um, when I wrote the book, I tell a lot of stories. I tell about my near death experiences and all the the clairvoyant, many different stories about clairvoyancy and things that happened to me, but also things uh, when you go through life and how we look at life and, um, you know, we have a tendency to think that everybody else has a harder life than we do. Well, that's because we sort of incarnated for those things mm-hmm. to learn, so to make our soul grow. Um, but I tell stories in the book uh, and then uh, allow the reader to reflect on what I tell them. But then there's also a message at the end of each chapter with, an exercise like how can they transform their path? How can they become more clairvoyant or clairaudient? We're all intuitive. That's mm. the thing. We're all mm. psychic. We all have this capacity within us, but nobody has ever taught us how to broad, you know, bring that out. How do you bring that aspect out of yourself? And mm. so that's why I teach workshops of psychic development and mediumship development. Um, so I kind of have my, my life is divided between my medical practice and my spiritual practice. And then I also do, um, you know, private sittings. I do mediumship readings. This is where you bring a spirit in, um, somebody that you know in the spirit world that's coming in to give you messages or psychic readings, which is related to you. And sometimes um, people do a combo reading. And many times during those readings, a spirit will come in and it's typically a spirit that has something in common with the person I'm reading for. And so that's why they were sort of chosen to bring the message because there is some um, physical connection or a mental connection, mm-hmm. you know, about, you know, their abilities and where they're heading. Mm-hmm. But oh, I, I love, love to do these things because it's, um, it helps other people find their, find their way and find their path yeah. in their life. Um, yeah. So that to learn more about me on that, they, 
people can go to drlotte.com, D-R-L-O-T-T-E.com. And then from there, they would click through. Um, I have a, a spot on that side that says Divine Spiritual Essence Mediumship and Workshops. Okay. And they click over and they actually get to my other website, which is divinespiritualessence.com. But it's okay. so long that it's so long that it's easier for people to just remember drlotte.com. Yeah, we will put the links in for that. So we'll put both of those links in so people don't need yeah. to work it out. They can literally just click. Yeah. Um, I know that we're in a time where there's a lot of things going on in the world. There's a lot of confusion right now, uncertainty with the virus and everything that's happening. Are you able to do these sessions via Zoom or Skype or some way online, or are they more in person? Uh, you mean for medical treatment? Or for, for the the readings and connecting? Yeah, yeah. So for the for the spiritual aspect, the mediumship readings, the psychic yeah. readings, that I do via Skype or uh, if I have readings uh, some, somewhere else in the world, sometimes we use the WhatsApp. Right, the, yeah. Yeah, and people have that on their phones. So I, we use FaceTime, WhatsApp, Skype. And, yeah, you know, whatever or, works, or really. Or just even the phone. Sometimes people um, you know, don't have access to a computer with a camera or they don't have a newer phone or something like that. Then yeah. we just do it as a phone call. So any, any way you know, that yeah. you can connect is really fine. That is brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Lottie. I love how far you've come with the technology from, you really make me laugh when you're talking about your watch and it's not working. So you go get another watch and then you get another one and then you get another one and your friend says it's you and you've got the remote control and you're walk right. in the neighborhood asking eight neighbors if it's them. Right. And, you know, I love that. And you've gone from that place. I mean, I know times have changed as well, but now we can do readings via WhatsApp. It's, it blows my mind. It's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lottie, for sharing your experiences. They're very full, beautiful experiences, and you've communicated them so well. I'd love to just discuss a little bit around the spiritual side of that, because I know you said your first one, you you didn't believe in God, you're pure, the end is, you know, there's darkness after that. So then you popped out of your body and you realized there was so much more and that you were so much bigger than the confinement of within the body. Mm -hmm. You went on to have your other experience where you saw angels that you didn't believe in, right. you felt connected to a God that you hadn't acknowledged and, again, probably didn't believe in. So how does this all work? At what point did you start to accept that there is a spiritual side to life, and how did that all sort of come together? Right, and it was, it was a long process. Literally, I'm sure. 12 years. <laughs> I'm a slow learner that way. I was so <laughs> stubborn, so scientific. Yeah. And I laugh when other people, you know, how um, I've done some speaking for IANS, International Association for Near Death Studies. Uh -huh. And I laugh because I was one of those people that were very skeptical and would ask questions. How do you prove, you know, how do you prove mm. it to me? How can, how can that be? And I came from that place myself. And so I, I think that's why it took me so long. And it was very, it was a very gradual experience for me because I had to go through all this learning about clairvoyancy and here, I, you know, I would hear things, I would see things. And it was a process where it had happened so many times for me to start trusting in it <laughs> and yeah. actually understand that. I wasn't, it's not just me. <laughs> yeah. There is something way greater that is in power here. And I'm just like a pawn in the play, right? Because yeah. it, it, it took me, it literally took me 12 years. It was a long journey. And it's because of, of being able to see things that it really turned me around to understand, um, okay, I can hear the spirit world. And then it wasn't until, it wasn't until 2017 um, that it really started clicking for me because now I learned that you can actually bring in the spirit for somebody else. Uh -huh. But in the beginning, it was just, I could hear the spirit world and I would sometimes know who it was, but could you actually bring in the spirit for somebody that, you know, you're doing a reading and that didn't come until really 2017 that I really started connecting with it that way. But that whole um, spiritual experience I have a hard time, you know, fitting into any religion. I, mm. I don't belong anywhere. Mm. I just belong in this um, place where all religions are important to me. Mm. And 
it is, um, and I talk a little bit about this in my book too, how, you know, we, we tend to forget, we complain about how can the world be this way? Well, you know, if, if there was a God, then how can it be this way? Yeah. You know, people say that, but people forget that we are in charge of the world. We are the ones who are living in the world and we are the ones that are creating the world that we live in. Mm-hmm. And so if there is something that's going on in the world that we don't like, guess what? We made it that way. God didn't make it that way. It's not that, you know, he's allowing it to happen because we are having an earthly experience and we, the, based on our own perceptions and who we are and where we came from, see the world through that lens. Yeah. And because all we have is our own lens and our own perception from our own life. And so that's why it's so difficult to put yourself in, in somebody else's position we don't know what it's like to live in a war zone unless we've been part of that ourselves. Mm. We can imagine it, but we don't understand it. It's mm. just like you can't understand what it's like to die and have a near-death experience and go to the other side and what that's really like unless you've had one. And it doesn't matter how much you try to explain it, right? And it's the same thing with everything. People who have been in traumatic car accidents – Exactly. I've never been, you know, I've been in fender benders and a little, you know, a little whiplash. Somebody yeah. ran into me, I standing still at a stoplight. That's not the same as being in a traumatic car accident with surgery and broken bones and maybe lost a family member. This tremendous trauma. I yeah. can't, I can try to imagine what they've gone through, but I, I can't because it's, I don't have that perception of life, right? Yeah. We all go through that. And it's the same with religion that, we, you know, religion was made for the people in that region of the world. And there were people that decided on what goes in those books of religion. Mm. You know, the messages may have come from, from a greater source, but the person who wrote it down also decided what was supposed to be written. You know, do we put this in the book or do we put that in the book? Mm. Right. Mm. And so there is always that element of it. And also, you know, all religions are meant to help people be, be, be better humans and, and better ability to cope with life, right? Mm. And it's, you know, it, it is the yin and yang of our existence on earth. Yeah. And I find it so interesting because this is a common thing that I hear from the experiences as I do these interviews is I no longer fit into a particular religion or belief system, but I believe we're all connected. We're all one. We are yeah. all collectively believing yes. the same thing with a different yes. different label on the box, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's so interesting. I love hearing your journey. I love hearing how you've developed through the years and things like that. You must have thought at some time, why did this happen? So do you have any ideas around that or do you have any ideas around how your life may have been if you hadn't been through these experiences? Oh, my life wouldn't have been at all what it is. Um, I, I mean, at this point in my life, I, I truly believe we sort of incarnate with, <laughs> with a manuscript of having to go through certain things in life uh, in order to develop the soul to the, to the next level. And I talk about this in my book too. It is like we come in with this backpack full of troubles and for each note of, that's in your backpack with, with a trouble written on it, and mm-hmm. it could be you know, uh, problems with your marriage or uh, maybe you're losing family members or maybe you always wanted children but you can't have any or whatever that mm-hmm. you know, could be you know, big traumatic things that people are going through. But as we go through them and as we grow through them, and it is through that, that darkness that creativity and transformation forms and, and you create new life, just like life is created in the womb. You plant the seed in the earth and it's that new life comes out of that darkness. And it's the same when you think of it emotionally, when you go through difficult times, um, you know, you become a stronger person in the end. Mm. And so looking at my own life, when I went through it and I was sick and I, I of course, many times ask, why me? Why am I going through this? I'm yeah. only in my 30s. I can't function like a human. I'm relying on my friends to come help me do my dishes. I was so weak. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you, know, you wonder why you're going through all that. But when you finally come out on the other side, what you learn is that nothing lasts forever. 
it's everything is transient in your life. And so now we're dealing with the coronavirus that is going around the world. And what's interesting with the coronavirus is that we're all um, becoming more aware of our fellow um, people in the country or even in the world. Yeah. We're posting things on social media about how Italy is singing on the balconies. Right? I know. And yeah. <laughs> loving it. And all of a sudden we're all connected to Italy. Yeah. Right. And so there's this connection that's, that's happening and we're becoming globally aware of how quickly things will fly through the world you know, a, a pandemic like this. And we're lucky that it's not worse and the death rate is fairly low compared to some previous viruses where the death rate has been much, much higher. Yeah. But we, it's also a good <clears throat> lesson for us because we are a global community where we are all living on this earth and using its resources together. And there is so much greed and conflict between countries in the world of of power, you know, economic power, whereas we really are all one and we are all in one community on earth. But um, we tend to forget that. But this this coronavirus has, I think, awakened um, mm. that in many people because we can see how quickly a virus like this travels around the earth and it makes us realize that we're just one community in the end. We're mm. one global community. And really, we have to help each other out all over the world. Mm. The totally agree. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And I think it's made us realize just how small our world is. Yes. I love your outlook. I'm a big believer that in everything that there is positivity, that there is something good that can come out of the harshest things. I call it the gift of crisis about when right. things are really falling apart. And I mean, I'm in New Zealand where it's nowhere near had the impact as it does over other parts of the world. And I feel very lucky by that. But what I have been seeing firsthand is people becoming a lot more connected to the way they spend their time, to their actions, to their emotions, to the things that they feed into their life, which I think is a really positive thing. Yeah. It's definitely a shame that it's taking quite a lot to get to that point. But yeah, yeah I, I agree with what you're saying. and I think it's very beautiful. Yeah. I think your, your entire experience, both of your experiences put together are absolutely beautiful. And I want to say again, thank you so, so much. We're going to put your links in there. I'd love people to go and check out this book. It's incredible. I would love people to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better online. And so Dr. Lottie Valentine, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show. My pleasure. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast show. If you've enjoyed it, Please share it with your friends, tell people about it. I'd love to get these messages out there. Don't forget you can also pick up your VIP access pass for additional content at patreon.com forward slash Kirsty Salisbury. You can connect with us via the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page and I look forward to catching you for another episode soon.